Hello, welcome to Ed Talks. My name is Lisa Doolittle. I'm the current Board of Governors Teaching Chair, and it's my pleasure to welcome today Dr. David Slomp, who is going to succeed me in more ways than one, I'm sure, um, from the Faculty of Education, and myself, I'm from the Faculty of Fine Arts. Welcome, David. Yeah, thank you. Very wonderful yeah. to talk to you. Yeah. Whatever made you a teacher? Yeah, ironically, it was poor planning. Um, <laughs> poor planning. I, um, I, I was going to high school in northern BC, and I, um, my parents were looking at moving around the time when I was in grade 11 and 12, and so I applied to a number of universities for, I wanted to do a creative uh, honors degree in creative writing is what my, my ambitions were, and, and my parents ended up um, moving to just north of Edmonton, so U of A became sort of the, the destination of choice at that point, and I hadn't planned my high school courses um, with the U of A in mind necessarily. And so anyways, I applied for the arts program I got in. And in June, a friend emailed me who was at a different school. And, and she had said, can you help me study for my grade 12 French? And I said, sorry, I, I, I didn't take grade 12 French. And she said, well, how did you get into the arts program? Because she had been planning all along to get into arts at the U of A. And there was a French 12 requirement. They had misread my transcript. Ah. I had a course that was right above the transcript that, was that, that they'd taken the grade for that, put in for French 12. And so suddenly I had this dilemma, what do I do? <laughs> And I didn't want them to discover halfway through my degree that I actually shouldn't have been admitted because I didn't have the entrance requirements. So I phoned them up and said, this is a situation. I think you made a mistake. What do I do? And they said, well, we can take you into, you're right, we can't take you into arts because you don't have the entrance requirements. So we can take you into education. We can take you into science. We can take you into business. And I thought, well, if I do education, I can do a major in English. Maybe I can do a major minor with overlapping courses and I can free up some courses to do the creative writing and so that's what got me into the faculty of education as an undergrad initially. But yeah, once I got into classrooms and got into schools and started working with kids, realized that this was a route that I was quite intrigued by and interested in and, and, uh, and so I haven't looked back. But initially, yeah, I, I didn't have an intention to go into education. It was happenstance, I suppose, that, that got me there. So yeah. what was it about the classroom, do you think, that made you so interested? I loved working with the kids, I think. That was that dynamic space um, where every day was different. You know, the challenges were new. Um, and, uh, and, and you couldn't predict how they were going to be different from day to day. It was depending on the mood of the room. It depended on the type of lesson that you were working on. Um, yeah, there were just so many factors. So I think it was that, that dynamic space uh, and the energy that it required that kind of that caught my attention and, and kind of drew me in. Yeah. Did you work as a public school teacher for how long? I taught in an independent school, so a, a private Christian school for five years um, before going on to do my PhD. Originally, I wanted to do 10 years of teaching, um, and uh, I met uh, someone who ended up being my supervisor at a conference who said, I'm going to retire sooner than later, and, and if you want to do a PhD with me, maybe you should apply sooner. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, the toughest part of doing a PhD is finding someone who might supervise you, so took that as a sign to move on. So Absolutely. Yeah. And then I kept teaching. Um, I taught as a PhD student. I taught at Norquest College, so more high school curriculum, but for adults, so kind of continued to expand my experiences there. So you've within. had, um, your, your bulk of um, teaching experience has been with mm -hmm. high school and, and junior high school students and then the adult population That's and right. now, of course, the That's right. university students. Yeah, no, the, yeah. That's quite a range yeah. still. Yeah. So your focus, even in your education and your teaching, was on English and in particular writing. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Um, tell me more about that. I remember vividly there was a, I don't know, it was junior high or something and... Um, there was a summer I had a, an uncle, my mom's one of the oldest in the family, and so her brothers are only slightly older than, than my, my older brother and I. But um, very creative. You know, I had an uncle who's an amazing artist. My wife is an amazing artist uh, in that. I've always envied that sort of, that kind of creative talent uh, with visual arts. I have a brother who's really gifted musically in that. And, and I remember as a junior high student thinking, where's my, where's my outlet? And, and writing kind of was my outlet. That was something that I, I was kind of drawn to, is that creative uh, outlet. Um, and that's what 
drove my focus as an undergrad was that creative writing piece. I did a lot of courses in creative writing as an undergrad. Um, and that, and so when I became a teacher, one of that one of those challenges when you're working with kids junior, senior, high, you, we see this kind of ebb and flow in kids' engagement with writing. You know, they love writing when they're when they're young. By mm -hmm. the time they hit junior high, they're they, they're losing some of that interest. By the time they hit high school, they hope to never write anything again in their lives, right? And then they get into first year writing in university, and they, they've only confirmed that that that's an issue for them. And so part of the challenge as a teacher was how do you how do you foster that engagement with writing, and how do you keep kids um, kids interested in that? I think was something that that kind of drove me. Yeah. So tell me about that. Yeah. How do you do that? I'm sure <laughs> you know people yeah. uh, watching this are going to yeah. say, "Yeah." So how do you? <laughs> yeah. You know, parents who shepherd their kids through yeah. homework and teachers who face classes full yeah. of kids who yeah. are more interested in video or images than writing, perhaps. How do you do it? I think a lot of it um, comes down to the way we teach writing um, has sort of devolved into processes that have more to do with managing a classroom than they do to fostering student growth and development. So we teach kids how to do five paragraph essays, for example. Not so much because five paragraph essays are foundational to the kinds of writing and knowledge about writing that kids need when they go into university or they go into the workplace, because no one really writes five paragraph essays outside of junior and senior high classrooms. Right. Um, but it's, it's a mechanism that enables a very messy and difficult process. It enables us to control that as a teacher, right? So kids can do um, they're pre-planning, they can do their outlines. We can walk them through in a week. Here's, so today we're gonna do your planning and then tomorrow we're gonna look at topic sentence and then we're gonna, or tomorrow we'll look at thesis statements then we're gonna look at topic sentence and then we're gonna look at supporting ideas. Then we're, and we walk kids through in a lockstep manner and they have this essay at the end, right? And, and, and I think the dissociation of that approach to writing from what writing in real life for real purposes looks like is often what kills kids' enjoyment and engagement with writing. And so my approach, I drew heavily originally on Peter Elbow's work with free writing, exploratory writing. My kids did a lot of journaling, which was very open and loose. I didn't grade it. Um, oftentimes, I didn't read it. Oftentimes, they would journal for two or three weeks, and I'd have them pick one or two journal entries that they wanted me to, to look at um, down the road. The requirement was they would do the work. And then from that material, they would identify things that were important to them or issues that, that were meaningful to them. Um, and those would become the foundations of the writing assignments that they would, that they would, do, for, um, that they would do for me. The work I'm doing now with teachers in schools is focused on real world writing for real purposes and that. Um, and it, it is amazing to me when kids use writing to serve a real purpose, to communicate with a real audience that they're going to get a real response from, it totally changes their association um, with writing uh, and that. And, and um, so the kids I'm working with right now, we're writing grant proposals to, for community improvement initiatives. Um, Tomorrow I get to go to Coldale and go to the reopening of the Coldale Dog Park because the grade six class that R.A. Baker um, got uh, initially, I think it was $2,000 from the Community Foundation of Southern Lethbridge in Southwestern Alberta to improve the dog park there. From that, they got funding from the Kinsmen and the Kins and Kinets, uh, mm -hmm. sort of partner funding in that. So they, you know, they're putting in benches, they're putting in trees, they're they're putting in things to to. But the kids um, have learned through this process how powerful writing can be in their lives. Part of this approach has been teachers stepping aside entirely. We're trying to teach kids how to figure out how to learn to write things that no one's no one's taught them how to write before. There's been some guidance, but the kids have had to figure out what goes into a proposal. You know, what are the things we need to pay attention to? Why is a proposal? Why does that genre even exist? Why do grant agencies even use them? Why not just give money out based on a phone call or a PowerPoint or something? Why a proposal? Why structure it that way? So the kids have had to learn all about these things uh, in the process of doing this work. And this is grade six. Grade six kids, yeah. 
You're yeah. kidding me. Yeah, no. So it's been uh, it's been an exciting process. Well, I hope them. they make yeah. it into my classes. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> Eventually, for that's sure. fantastic. Uh, I isn't that fantastic? Because yeah. it's true, isn't it? I mean, writing without a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. How would you get fired yeah. up about it? And and we create often in our writing assignments. We we create the idea that there's an audience, but kids really know. Ninety, I mean. I would say 90% minimum of assignments kids write in school are for a teacher. And a teacher might say, well, let's pretend that this is the audience. But if they never actually send it to that real audience, then they're, um, they know, I'm just writing for my teacher. And, and my teacher looks for these sort of things regardless of what the genre is or what the assignment is. These are the things I need to do for my teacher. So before the kids in this project did the grant writing, they wrote reviews of movies, films, books, or apps for a, a website called teenink.com and that. And I remember the day I came into an interview with a student and I said, what, how, do you, how do you feel about writing? And I said, well, I, I've never really liked writing, but that's changing. And I said, oh, talk to me about that. And he said, well, my review for teenink.com was an editor's choice over the weekend and it was voted the, the top review in its, in its category this weekend, right? Real people read this and real people responded in genuine ways and suddenly now, oh, I'm interested in this yeah. in a way that I haven't been for a long time, right? I think that's kind of what we're Yeah, that we're connection, because writing is a communication. Yeah. But I want to say yeah. something. I just want to pick yeah. up on this, and um, you're saying real people are reading my writing. So mm. a teacher's not a real person in this world? I mean, what, <laughs> so I'm hearing, like, the erasure well, of the yeah. teacher here, and here we're supposed to be talking about teaching. Like, yeah. what? So what, then, yeah. is the teaching about? Because you're saying, so they're yeah. not supposed to be writing to the teacher or right. you know, ultimately to a test. So then yeah. it changes the concept of, yeah. of, of what the role of the teacher is, doesn't it? It does, yeah. One of the things when I started on this project with, these, with, with the group of teachers I'm working with, um, we, we kind of looked at what is writing, what skill sets are we trying to help kids develop, um, what knowledge about writing are we hoping to, um, to build in our, in our classrooms. And then we looked at what are the writing? What, what are the writing assignments we're doing? How are we teaching writing currently? And and are these processes that we're using in our classroom actually supporting the kinds of growth and development that we want? And what we what we recognized as a group was that we've been scaffolding writing instruction wrong for a long time. All of these templates and processes aren't actually teaching kids how to figure out how to write something nobody's taught them how to write before, which I think is really the skill that we're trying to help kids develop. So that when they come to your class, for example, and you say, I want you to write um, a, a review for me, or I want or you to play. write a play or a proposal mm -hmm. to a director or a produce, production company, they actually have the skill sets to figure that out. Right? We don't, we don't really teach kids how to do that. Um, most of the work we do um, does the deep thinking for kids. And that. Um, so when we give kids a five paragraph essay template, we haven't taught them how to analyze the structure or the genre of an essay. We've just said, fill go in and the do blank. this, fill in the blanks, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then they come to university, and a uh, history prof says, I want you to write an essay for me. And they go, OK, I have this template. I know. And the history prof says, that's not an essay. This is an essay. And then their biology prof says, I want to write you. He wants you to write an essay. And they say, that's not an essay either. And, and kids go, ah. I don't know what to do here uh, because I haven't figured out how to figure this out. And people, uh, all, all professors end up saying, I'm teaching my students how to write right. as well as teaching the subject yes, matter. Yes, right, yeah, because we haven't taught them how to figure things. So in that way, we created the fiction of audience as teachers often. And here, I think it's no different at the post-secondary level than is at the high school level. We, we create the fiction of audience. We say, you have to write this for a professional context. You have to write this for, but what we really mean is you have to write this for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in that way, I'm saying, that, yeah, the teacher is a real audience. But if the teacher is the only audience, the fiction of you're learning how to write for diverse rhetorical contexts kind of falls apart. And kids never really learn how to analyze that rhetorical context, how to figure out how to write for you versus how to write for a biology professor, or how to write a letter to a, an insurance company, or a letter to someone in government, or, you know, um, we just don't teach kids that, uh, because often we just ask them to write for us. Uh, and, that, and, and you're and, saying you're, yeah. you're, even by yeah. handing them, you know, a letter template, yeah. that's, that's not going to do it. 
No, because what they need to understand is what are the values that drive this audience? Right? What expectations do, do they have? If I'm going to write a letter to someone in government, what, 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 what values drive that person in terms of how they're going to interact with that piece? If I'm going to write a letter to an insurance company advocating for something for myself, well, what values and expectations are they going to have? If I'm going to write to a, a business letter to a local business about um, funding, you know, some event I'm having, how, how, what are their values and expectations, right? And so, if I so haven't how, learned yeah, how to figure ahead. that out, um, mm -hmm. often I'm not going to be successful, right? Yeah, I was, I was sorry yeah. to interrupt, yeah. but I was thinking then, then an example, like even just from the Kinsman example, how did the grade sixes do that? I mean, right. how, what did you do? What did they have to, is it research or mm -hmm. like yeah. what do they do? It, yeah, it's very research intensive. So in this case, they met with, um, they met with the director of um, the granting agency that they were going to apply with. Apply to right. Wow. He actually came to their classroom and and they met with him and they had a series of questions about the organization, what it was goals and objectives were, what its history was. Right. So they were able to ask him directly. Now, often you don't have access in that way, mm -hmm. but they were also able to go on to the website for the organization and look at all of that information there. They went in and looked at the board of directors and looked at who were these people and what did their bios, what did they emphasize in their bio statements that really? said something about who they were and what values okay. they were bringing to the organization uh, and that. So they were able to kind of build a picture to start with about who this grant agency was and what um, what values they were bringing to to the work of, of community development and so that they could then decide which project. Initially there were about six or seven projects that the mm -hmm. kids were thinking of and in their in their analysis of the agency and in their conversations with the director they narrowed it down to, to the dog park one. But yeah, so it, it's research intensive, mm -hmm. certainly, um, where they have to go in and take a look at these things. They looked at grant proposals. We didn't tell them this is what needs to go in a grant proposal. Part of what they had to do was look at sample grant proposals that were successful and say, okay, what was going on in these things? What oh, was the amazing. content that, that people were working with? Mm -hmm. What were the rhetorical moves that they were making. So the teacher has to help in that case, because right. a, a, a grade six is going to say, there's yes. a good rhetorical move. Right, no, <laughs> right. So we, they, we would use different language, right? But yeah. we would say what, we, we did things like what we call the says does analysis. So a says analysis is look at each paragraph in the grant and, and we would look at what is, what is the paragraph saying? Mm -hmm. But then we would also look at what is the paragraph doing? If it's giving us background information uh, about the project, that's what it says. But, but what is it does. And they would look at things like they'd say, well, there's lots of detail and there's lots of information here. And then we'd ask questions about, okay, well, what is that level of detail? What is it doing? And they would say, well, maybe it's giving the reader confidence ah. that we've, we understand our project and we can describe it well. So that confidence is important because it tells them that we're likely able to be successful in, in fulfilling what wow. we're trying to do. Wow. So that's part of that, that process. I mean, in this case, the teacher, she was quite phenomenal and she was able to take close reading strategies that she had already taught them and bring it into this project and say, remember when we did this close reading exercise, um, the way we were able to, to look at specific things that were happening in, in paragraphs or in text. So, so we're looking yeah. at a, a teaching yeah. of, a, of, a, of a unit or of something really over a very long term yeah. made up of all these um, really um, key building blocks. Yeah. And like you say, bringing forward reading skills into, into the yeah. writing. Yeah. That's uh, pretty key, hey? Reading skills, research skills. I think that when we first started on this, this project with the teachers, that the, the, the amount of research that it required of the kids it was something that I think kind of surprised all of us a little bit, you know? I mean, intuitively, I think I, I kind of understood, yeah, but when we actually got them into it, and for the teachers, that was an adjustment to say, boy, we really had, this took weeks longer than we thought it would because of how much background work needed to go into um, into figuring these things out, right? But, and yet the yeah. outcome yeah. is powerful and the confidence that the yeah. kids have in their writing afterwards yeah. is yeah. Yeah. gone through the roof. Absol yeah, absolutely. And, and it was interesting, the, the network of, of genres that kids identified. So suddenly it became, we started on this proposal, 
but then the kids ended up writing emails to you know the arborist or you know the bench maker or and they would be writing emails to me or they would be you know writing uh, and then they'd be writing letters to the kinsmen or the kinats or um, some of the kids ended up doing presentations at um, sort of leadership conferences for kids right so suddenly this one project spawned all these other associated pieces of writing, right? So they started to understand that to achieve your objectives, there's a network of genres that you're going to have to know and, and wow. be able to draw on. So it, um, yeah, it's far richer, I think, and more complex than they might have originally recognized. So, so that's at the grade school level. Um, what do you, talk about the university level. Here you are in the Faculty of Education, your kind of day-to-day -day work here. How, how does that uh, play out for you? What kinds of things do you run into? Mm -hmm. Um, with this level, you know, students yeah. who are then going to go out and become teachers. I had more opportunity when I was at the U of A because there was a course that I taught there that was on teaching writing explicitly. Oh, okay. And that okay. where um, part of what I try to do is model these kinds of processes and demonstrate to students that the scaffolding that we that we historically have done around writing isn't working and try to demonstrate that for them. So again, rather than um, giving my students sort of templates for assignments is I'm going to engage them in in some process so I might give them two or three example pieces and say I want you to read through these and then we'll discuss them in groups what are you noticing in them how are they functioning what are the things that are making this a successful piece or, or a not successful piece or you know if we do um, unit design we might go on to the Alberta Assessment Consortia's um, website and pull up examples from teachers in the field of, of of units or projects that they've okay. done and, and look at three or four or five of them and then learn to extrapolate from those some of the features that might be useful features for them to bring into their own their own work. So I rarely tell students these are the things you need to do. Mm -hmm. More often what I do is provide them with exemplars or example pieces that they then extrapolate principles from. And even scoring guides, I'm, I'll, I might have a scoring guide in, in, in place but almost always I will get them to design criteria based on their review of sample texts. Mm -hmm. And then once they've done that, um, I will take the scoring guide that I've given, that I had already developed, and get them to analyze the criteria that they identified over against the criteria that I had. And we might make revisions to mine. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of get them to notice, what are the things that you've caught that I've missed? And what are the things that I've identified that you might have missed? And then we right. can have a conversation about criteria there. So it's, in, in some ways, it's simple kinds of strategies that we work with them to help them even just understand some parts of this, this kind of process. Right. And that. Um, right. Yeah. Here at the U of L, what's your focus then if, if it's not on teaching writing? Mostly I'm teaching assessment. So classroom right. assessment is the area that they hired me in, in for. Um, I've, I've done some of the work in language arts methods, but it's been a few years since I've done that. And then a good bit of my work right now is with graduate students. We have a master's program in curriculum and classroom assessment. So oh. I teach uh, a number of the courses in that, uh, in wow, that program. Wow, that's uh, pretty yeah. specialized. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, ha ha What's that like? Yeah. Just teaching how to write exams. Sounds um, awful well, to know. me. <laughs> Never having, no. you know, been trained in yeah. how to write exams, yeah. you know, in the fine arts exams are not our big yeah. thing necessarily. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds, from my perspective, yeah. a bit dry. So yeah. what's the meat right. of it? What's the, what's the fun part of it? The fun part for me, um, well, we pull the lens quite a bit further back to start with. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first course that I teach in the program is a foundations of assessment. So we really get into just theory of assessment. And one of the driving ethics of the program is that when we look at um, research and theory in the field of curriculum, and we look at research and theory in the field of assessment, um, over the last uh, 40, 50 years, the two fields have kind of split from each other. And that, and so the sort of one of the core goals of our program is, is to find ways to better align assessment practices with current understandings of curriculum and, and, and curriculum and theory why and is educational that important? theory, so that they can better support each other. So what we often see is the values that drive assessment practices and the values that drive curriculum um, and and classroom practices don't align with each other, and so we see instances where um, the assessments undermine 
of what we're trying to achieve in classrooms through curriculum. And so bringing them better into it, bringing them into alignment with one another. Um, the hope and the goal is, is that our assessment practices and our teaching practices are, are going to work together more effectively to, to support the kind of growth and development in students that we're hoping for. So this is, yeah. are, am, am I right in saying yeah. this is counteracting that teaching to the test mentality? This is where that yeah. graduate research is right. going? Yeah, the foundations of assessment. Well, one of the areas I really focus on is on um, what we call construct construct validity. So, okay, um, construct so under validity. Understanding the core knowledge, skills, and sort of dispositions that are central to the fields that we're working in. So in your area, where we're looking at, um, if you're looking at dramatic arts, well, what are the core knowledge, skills, and dispositions that you would need to develop to be successful in this field? Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so the, the, the beginning and the work that our, the, our students do quite intensely is drilling down to really understand that the core dimensions of the field and once we have that understanding, then we go from there and say, okay, well, how do I measure? How do I measure that growth and, the, and development of those kinds of um, skills, knowledge, and, and, and dispositions in, in, in students? Um, so historically what's happened is we, we've had a set of assessment practices that, that, that have fit sort of psychometric standards of, of acceptability. So there's been, you know, multiple choice assessments. There's been impromptu essay type writing assessments. We don't often see in large scales testing a lot of performance assessments. They're, mm -hmm. they're too expensive and, and, and that. And, and so we've often started with, here's, here's the suite of assessment tools available to us. What can we measure? Um, classroom teachers don't start there, no. and instructors at post-secondary don't start there. We start with, what are we trying to achieve in terms of student growth and development in relation to the field that, that, we're, that we're drawing them into? Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to then evaluate that growth. But often, that's where the gap happens. We say, okay, we're trying to achieve this, but, but we can measure this. Um, and yet, the stuff that we can't measure as easily and simply is often the most important stuff that we're trying to achieve in classrooms. Except we can't measure as easily. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so our program begins with, and, and, and you get this in, in, in fields like measurement where um, I'm a measurement expert, and there's sometimes there's a sense I can measure, I can measure anything, right? I know how mm -hmm. to measure, I can measure anything. Well, what we try to argue in the program is that's, that's not the case. You really need to understand the field you're working in and then develop assessment practices that, that come out of that field. So, um, so in the end, yes, you're combating this notion of teaching to the test or working um, to the test. We're working to develop assessment programs that reflect the values of, of the disciplines we're working in. Yeah. Um, and that better support growth and development in that, in that area. Yeah. Now, uh, before we started, yeah. we were talking about the sort of standardized testing because yeah. it's kind of rampant. Because when people are hiring people in professions like nurses, you entrust mm -hmm. your life yeah, to yeah. a nurse or yeah. med school or, or almost any profession. This is huge. You want to have a standard to get into grad school. There are tests. To, you know, at every stage of existence, there mm -hmm. are tests. So this mm -hmm. is actually a pretty, mm -hmm. a pretty important yeah. um, thing to understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's evaluation and, yeah. and measuring yeah. what's it for, what yeah. what can we do? Right. What are the what are the things that your students find hardest about understanding that field? Or can you give me an example of stumbling yeah. blocks as they're trying to figure out how to measure better? <laughs> what we hope to to lead them through through this process is um, sort of a, a sort of a deep sense of humility about our assessment practices. Uh, to me, that's really important, um, in that. and that's often the, the hardest part for them as well. Right? We kind of look for certainty in that. We say, okay, you know, I know this, and I can measure this, and it's all neat, and it's all clean. But as we, as we really dig into these, to these constructs and really work to understand them, then we begin to recognize the enormous complexity involved in human development um, and, and, and in, in each of the disciplines we're trying to, to help, um, help students uh, gain expertise in. And that sense of complexity is, is often overwhelming for them. I bet. Um, they I they bet. just go hands in the air, I, I give up. It's, it, it, there's almost always a point in the, in the semester where, where that's the response. Hmm. Uh, and then I'm like, good, that's where we want you. 
<laughs> really? <laughs> now let's build from here. Wow. Right? You know, I look at and I use um, Jay Gould has a has a book on um, assessment in, in um, the field of intelligence testing um, called The Mismeasure of Man. And it's I a great look, touchstone yeah. text for me because it it captures so well how much damage we do to people when we have a sense of overconfidence in our capacity to measure human development, human capacity, right, and that. And so that, that humility is a really important place for me to, to say we need to get there so that when we look at the assessments we're using and we're looking at taking that information and making decisions about people's lives based on that information, we do that with a profound sense of our limitations in, 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 in our capacity to do that well. Hmm. And so we might be more tentative about the judgments we make. We might be more um, thoughtful about the decisions um, that we take based on that and, and the implications that might have on, on, on people's lives and that. So yeah, that's, that's an important place for, for me to... Difficult in the world that we have of yeah. needing quick yes. assessments. Yeah. Short terms, you know, Yeah. needing to push people through. Yeah. That's a difficult thing to maintain, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's an ethic that I think in the school system that I try to really work with in my own work is to really help. Um, classroom teachers get it. It's not, I mean, because they live that and they, they see firsthand the consequences of poor assessment practices, right? So, so they get that. They see kids falling right, back. Right, they see it, right? They see the consequence for kids. You step back from the classroom and I think the further removed from the classroom you are, the more... Um, the less you see those problems, right? And I have a, a piece that I, I did a few years back, which was a review of all the literature on the consequences of large-scale writing assessment practices on on writing instruction in, 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 in Canada. So it was a Canadian-focused piece and that. And one of the conclusions that came out of that was the further from the classroom the, um, the research was, the more positive it was about the the outcomes and the effects and the consequences of these of these assessment tools, but the closer to the classroom it was, often the more negative um, the findings but were. The tools that the tools for examining people didn't right. actually and, measure the right things and the consequences. So ah. if you're a, if you have a systems level perspective, if you're a director of education, and you say this is great. We use this data to inform decision making at the classroom level or at the school level, and we can use this data to to do all sorts of wonderful things. And then you talk to teachers who kind of live through the consequences of those decisions, and they say, yes, but the test isn't actually measuring the things that are really important, for example. Mm -hmm. And so you're developing this program to say, we're going to, we're going to identify the kids who are at risk, and we're going to put in interventions in place to help those kids, which often means we're going to design more instruction that's going to push more kids to focus on the narrow set of skills that the test is measuring when as a teacher what I really value is the broad sense the broad skills the more complex skills but my kids are getting a more reductive education and losing interest and losing interest right mm -hmm. as a as, right, as a result yeah. right so they they're living those consequences mm. but when you're not you, you don't see it directly or you don't have that expert knowledge yeah um, you don't yeah. see the problems how is this going to work? You're, you've just been appointed the Board of Governors Teaching Chair. So this is all, you know, yeah. you're, you're talking about <laughs> kids in the classroom and you can be general and, you know, you've got a bunch of professors here. And so the, the role of the teaching center is to support teaching on campus. So many of the, the teachers or the instructors here haven't been trained in instruction. That's one of the things, one of the reasons for the teaching center. Mm -hmm. um, of course, many of the teachers, especially at the U of L mm -hmm. and uh, you know mm -hmm. across universities, are, are great instructors. Mm -hmm. How are you going to put this to work as the new board chair? What are you, what are you going to draw from your personal experience yeah. and and you know uh, provide to the mm -hmm. campus teaching community? Uh, what do you think at this yeah. point? You know, I mean, well, I think one, I'll look for the partnerships as they as people as people are interested in them and, and, and see who's, who's interested in working on some of these issues and questions. But um, an example of a project that I've just, we're kind of in the second year on in the Faculty of Education, but it started with, I did an analysis of all the assignments in the undergraduate education program. And we oh did an goodness. analysis, we mapped them all, we looked at, um, and based on that, we, as a faculty, 
um, decided that we needed to redesign our professional semesters because they, the, there were far too many assignments, for example, um, and uh, they weren't getting at, they were siloed. So the, the students weren't getting, an in, we design our practicum to be integrated courses and then we assess them separately in each course. And then students get into the field and that's where we expect them to integrate. Um, they're thinking across these courses. And we said, it, it's actually not the model we want. What we want is, and it was the research and the assignments that kind of help bring, make that clear that we've got up to 50 assignments in an eight week semester for some students. Wow, in an right? eight week semester. So students are, or eight or 10, right? Eight or 10 weeks, depending on which one we're looking at. Wow. Um, and so students are overwhelmed. Students are, are just basically getting things done. And we're not getting necessarily um, the depth of engagement or thinking that we want. And we're not getting the cross, the cross course thinking that, or, you know, that we want them to do. So, so based on that analysis, we ended up doing a, a redesign of the professional semester. We designed three core assignments that were integrated across all the modules in there and that. And we're, we're just working on a project now to further enhance um, that work. So I think that's kind of a, a, an example of the kinds of um, work that I can do is work with faculty to say, let's take a look at your assessment practices right now. What are they doing? Are they achieving the goals that you're, that you're hoping for? You know, if you're interested in looking critically at them to say, let's define the constructs that are core to our discipline. Mm -hmm. And let's then take a look at our assessment practices to see, are we actually measuring those things? And if so, great. And if not, what are different types of assignments that we can do? Um, that can help us get at promoting um, the, the development of students in relation to the disciplines we're, we're working toward. Oh, interesting. Um, and and you, could, so, you could work with assignments of any kind? So my process is... <laughs> you know, like, a, yeah. I'm thinking of my own assignments yeah. and thinking, oh, I don't know, you know, they've got yeah. to do a fight scene. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh. Right. So, so, so the question, so for my role isn't to provide the expertise, it's to provide yeah. some of the design processes and some of the questions and, and kind of help guide a faculty through or, or a department through some of those explorations to say, okay, so if you're doing a fight scene as part of, uh, of an assignment, some of the questions I would ask is first, let's back up and say, okay, what are you trying to achieve? So what, again, what are the constructs that are core to mm -hmm. your program? Um, and uh, let's map those out first. And then let's look at your fight scene assignment and say, okay, which of these things is it mapping onto? Mm -hmm. which, which facets of this construct is it, is it connecting to? Which ones is it not, not addressing? If we do that for one assignment, then we do it for the whole course, suddenly we get a picture of here are, here are the dimensions of the construct that are really, that we've identified as important. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the things that I'm doing, I've actually missed this whole piece of it. Right. Now, I have to make a decision as an instructor. Is that important to me that I've missed that and do I need to address that? Or, um, or is, it, is that really not that, that Just something that I've inherited. Essential, yeah. Right, is that not that essential? And, and, that. And, and, and then there's this issue of irrelevant variance, the sense of am I measuring things that are actually not core? to the discipline yeah, because it's just an that accepted way of measuring actor, things, right? You know, exactly. Might that, not right? really be judged on somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. So you could, you could look at that for your, your course and more powerfully still, if you looked at what is the sequence of courses students take as they come through this program right? and let's map all of the courses into there, then you can see as a program are we hitting the things that we're after or are we, are we missing key things? And mm -hmm. if we're missing the key things, what are the implications for us on a programmatic level in terms of design? So Yeah, that's, that's very interesting because it does, uh, you know, the, from the student perspective, yeah. that's, yeah. it's, you know, I want to get there. Right. Yeah. So all these different teachers feed yeah. into that student yeah. uh, getting yeah. there. Yeah. And we have created a bit of a fragmented education system. Right. I mean, because yeah. we do the liberal education, right. we have to take so many yeah. different courses yeah. that yeah. in a way it resembles a, right. a teacher training in a yeah. way yeah. where you have to yeah. know many different yeah. disciplines and be prepared. And, and then that's a good context, it's a good question, right? I mean, if you look at the liberal ed dimension of the program, mm -hmm. to say, for me, it begins with core questions. What is liberal ed about? Mm -hmm. What are we trying to achieve, right? What knowledge? What skills, what dispositions are we trying to enculturate through this, this focus in our program? 
you know, I don't know if we've ever done that here. Mm -hmm. Looked at defining those things clearly and, and mapped out all the pieces of it. And, and then to look at, okay, what's the route through and what are the assessments that are happening in as students move along that route? And are they actually helping students to develop the things that we've articulated up front? Right. And, and if not, so it's a way of looking at program effectiveness and, and, and kind of revisiting some of, um, some of the design choices that we've made along the way. And of course, what, we're, what you're talking about is uh, the other problem for so many professors is grading. Mm -hmm. Grading, ah, yeah. which is so key. And yet, it, I, maybe I'm just speaking from a personal perspective, but I have yeah. heard other professors yeah. go, oh, yeah, now I'm grading. Yes. So how can we, <laughs> how can we make... Uh, yeah. yeah, make that less of a, I, I, yeah. once I sit down to yeah. it, of course, it's very important and really, uh, really yeah. is so revealing about yeah. uh, the student development. But yeah. um, I often say to my, uh, my wife or my colleagues, for someone who teaches assessment, I, uh, I sure hate this part of my job far too much. <laughs> is that, no, really? The actual uh, sitting down and grading, you have that too? Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, Heck, why is that? Yeah. Why is that? It's... Uh, Facing the music about your yeah, own teaching, isn't it? Yeah. Gosh, I thought they knew. Yeah. <laughs> there, yeah, there's a bit of that. I mean, it's a joy. It, I mean, I remember with the masters in curriculum and assessment, you know, the first time you spend a summer with them critically looking at assessment practices and then you have to assess them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it sure, uh, um, it sure forces you to, uh, to re-examine some of the practices that you've been using and not take them for granted yourself. So I think there's part of that for, um, uh, for me is always the challenge of, um, yeah, doing it well and doing it consistently and, and doing it effectively. It, it's not so much for me the, the gap between I thought they knew this and, um, and this is what I'm seeing. I really work on a lot of formative assessment work. So yeah. my goal yeah. in my program is to really understand where they are along the way. And in some ways, that's why where my problem comes is. And I feel like by the time I've got that final assignment or whatever, I already have a pretty good idea of where my students are. Uh, and then it just feels like an enormous amount of work to formalize that, mm. you know, through this kind of approach um, and that. So I'm always looking at ways to improve, improve the grading and the assessment practices and that. Yeah, and, um, yeah. <laughs> it's an ongoing, it's yeah. an ongoing battle. Yeah, yeah. for sure. You know, we create structures like rubrics and grading skills as a way to do that, but oftentimes I find that they're not as effective a tool as we want them to be. So then, certainly, the, there's a. You know, I, I'm not speaking for everybody, yeah. but there's a fair amount of resistance I've heard anecdotally in my faculty around, you know, rubrics and pinning things down in the fine arts. But I heard yep. you earlier also yep. say that some of the things that are most important to measure. Yeah. And I suspect that's true in any field, yep. science, uh, across the board. Yeah. Um, we, we don't measure well. So how are we going to work on that on campus here? I mean, right. certainly forming teachers. Yep. Yep. <laughs> the, you know, the huge skill is, yep. is not, it, I mean, it's intangible, a, yep. a good teacher in yep. a way. Yeah. Um, and and how, how you work at making yep. a good teacher. Yeah. To me, it begins with constructs, again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, going tunneling, I, mean, I think a lot of our assessment practices fall apart when we don't understand deeply and richly the constructs that we're trying to measure and teach to, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, writing is a good example. Um, you can, in, in, in most ed programs in Alberta, and I think in Canada, you can be an English major in education and never have taken a single course in writing. Right. Unbelievable. And now you go into schools and you have to teach writing uh, and that, right? And, and so um, it's not a surprise then that a lot of language arts teachers don't have a, as deep and rich a sense of, of the core constructs connected to writing ability as we would want them to be. And if you don't have that, then um, it's, it's easy to adapt practices that maybe aren't the best practice, because we don't really understand why it's not mm -hmm. the best practice. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's true at any, you know, within any, within any, any course content, any course area. If we, if we don't know the constructs well, if we haven't articulated them clearly for ourselves, then it's hard to really know what we're measuring right. and, and, and if we're measuring it well. Yeah. Um, 
in that. So to me, that's really at this level too, to have those conversations as faculty. What, what knowledge, skills, and dispositions are we working toward here in mm -hmm. this program? How does my course contribute to that? Um, and, and, uh, and then how, am I, how does my assessment plan capture, uh, capture that, right, right, I think, in that. And, and, and part of the humility piece is recognizing that no matter how well I've thought through my assessment plan, there are always going to be limitations in how I do that, right? Mm -hmm. And that, so I so think that's part ongoing. of it. It is absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, you'll never, you'll never create a perfect assessment, and that, that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. You know, the fear of grading is not just sitting down and grading. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it comes before that. With, yeah. uh, as I was saying earlier, the, yeah. you know, professors are not trained necessarily yeah. educators. Yeah. And so when uh, faced with, um, again, the example perhaps from yeah. myself yeah. faced with I really you know I'm, I'm a dancer I really yeah. know how to make a dance but how yeah. am I going to assess a student who's making a dance and so you start to talk to me and I think yeah. all I can think of yeah. is uh, number one you're you're reducing this fabulous thing yes. that's so important you, right. you, you want to assess this and right. how can it be assessed right. and yet the need the need to do it yeah. and also what do you yeah. know about dancing <laughs> yeah. How yeah. can you help me? Yeah. You don't know anything yeah. about it. Yeah. So how do you approach um, assessment resistance or yeah. assessment fear? Part of it is starting from your own perspective, right? And to say, this is, like I said, it's the part of my job that I, that I dislike the most. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I, I mean, I empathize with faculty who say, this is, this is something that um, is, uh, is not comfortable always um, for me, right? And I think humility in the sense of recognizing, you know, no matter how often I work on, on assessments in my own classroom, or my own practice to say, they're not, they're not perfect. There's problems with them and, and limitations to them. And that's okay because what we're trying to do is complex. What I try to do with my own student teachers uh, and my graduate students who have a lot of experience and, and, and are going through is to say, understanding the limitations isn't reason to throw your arms in the air. It's just simply a way of saying, if I'm aware of them, I can be more, um, more cautious about the judgments and the uses of the assessment data, right? So I think that that's part of it, I think, is, is just, in, in a sense, modeling in your own work some of those, those problems. But I think, and not starting from a point of deficit to say, I would never, you know, I don't think um, it's ever productive to talk to people and say, there's something wrong with your practices. No, you're, not, right? you're no good at this. No, <laughs> but it's about looking at helping people develop um, awareness of some of the issues, I think. So I've developed uh, a design process that I work with. So this summer, my grad students are going through. It's going to be three, we three weeks. It's a design process that's really, it's about, again, that construct-centered design process. We go, OK, what are the uses? In, what, are, what are we hoping to achieve with our assessments? What uses are we trying to, to, to make of the assessment data? What inferences about students are we trying to draw from, mm -hmm. from this? Um, who are the stakeholders? You know, so there's a lot of sort of opening questions that we begin with and that. And, and really that's my, I don't, I don't need to know dance, for example. Mm -hmm. I can guide you through that process to say, let's, let's look at these questions together. Let's, let's examine some answers to this based on uh, how we, you know, what inferences we're trying to make about students or how we hope to use this, this assessment data, we can then make some decisions about what kinds of things we're going to assess. If you go through and, and draw, on you, and you're right, for me to go in and, and do a construct map around all the knowledge, skills, and dispositions associated with Dan's, I mean, that's a PhD for me to have to go through to do. You have that knowledge. You know mm -hmm. that, right? Um, but, but maybe what you you might need help with is how do we map that and what is it what is a con what does it look like to sort of map those features out and make them explicit so often we have solid intuitive knowledge about our fields but we don't always make it as explicit to ourselves or to our students right as uh, you know as, as we might so this is a process the process that I guide my own students through is how to make that those th those assumptions and those understandings explicit right instead of intuitive right yeah. and once we make them explicit now I can design I can look at my current assessments and say how are they functioning what are they doing right. and and there can be something that's very um, confirmatory about that mm -hmm. once I've mapped it and made it explicit I can look at my assignments and I can say yes I am actually measuring 
the things that I that I believed were core to my field. Right. And now, because I have a, a concrete mapping of it, now I can actually make the case because I've I've done the linkages and I've done that, mm -hmm. um, and I can go from my assignment design to my scoring criteria because I can map my scoring criteria now back onto this construct map that I've developed. Right. right. So it can be very conformatory. Actually, I think that is that that can happen, um, and then. It, but it might also raise questions about things that I might not be, that I might be missing, or I might, I might not be doing. Yeah. Um, and, that. and I think, so. from my perspective, what, what's helped me um, is to realize that it's all very well. Like you can certainly assess a really good dance and a really terrible dance. Yeah. Yeah. But how do you help the students realize? I mean, that is really the core of assessment, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Which is what a lot of faculty. Right. I mean, they haven't had that experience in their own yep. education yep. of saying it's capacity yep. building. And so yep. really, it's the point of assessment is really formative for the student as yeah. well, or should be, yes. right? And that's yeah. the thing. It's all yeah. that gray area in between, yeah. Yeah. but also the really high and the really right. low. Like, what do yeah. I do with my, how does that student then from that assessment yeah. move forward right. instead of it just being like yeah. a judgment, right. you're good, you're bad. Yeah. Yeah. How does that assessment, because surely right. that's really what Absolutely. assessment should be about, yeah. not just yeah. a gateway of right. saying yes, no, yeah. but where the student can actually grow and yeah. you're actually teaching yeah. <laughs> through yeah. Yeah. the assessment. If you right. never tell a student how yeah. they're doing, yeah. then they're just swimming. But if every yeah. time you tell them how they're doing, it's just like yes, no, good, bad. Right. Yeah. It doesn't help. Right? It doesn't the end help of the doesn't that help. student. In some ways, your field's not that different from mine in the yeah. sense that... Um, if you're not helping them in that way, at the end of the day, they haven't learned how to learn how to dance in a sense, right? right. They're just they just look at script. this really great dancer right. and They're say, I wish I was something. like that. Right, exactly. And they haven't. <laughs> so I, mean, I often talk in my own work about the gap between performance and sort of metacognitive capacity connected to that performance. So what is okay. my thinking? What's my thinking as a writer, right? Uh, in this case, what's your thinking as a dancer, right? Are you able to. Are you able to analyze a dance and look at it and see what makes it a good dance versus what makes it a poor dance? Are you able then to take from that analysis some ideas about what I might do in my own dance, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, 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 and have I learned how to use um, my own sort of critical awareness, uh, both of the field and of myself, to be able to drive my own development, right? Ultimately, you're right. That is, that's what we're trying to achieve, whether it's with writers, give. whether it's with, right. So with our student teachers, when I go out in the field and watch a student teacher, my first question always is, is talk to me about how that went, right? And I can mm -hmm. tell you, my, my best student teachers are almost always the most critically aware of their practice. And they're always, always, they'll, they'll start off with, I'll have watched a brilliant lesson. And they will spend the first 10 minutes answering that question, telling me about all the things they could have done differently or better. And I'll have to step in and say, OK, well, tell me what went well. <laughs> and then they can talk about what went well. But they've learned to be critically disposed to themselves as teachers in that. Whereas my, the ones that are almost universally the weakest are also the ones where the students go, well, I think it went OK. <laughs> and then you, then you have to start asking a lot more questions about, OK, well, let's look at what happened here and let's, let's explore And that, that's right? an assessment right there. It is, that absolutely. You're doing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's an yeah. interactive one. Yeah. And a, like yeah. you say, a formative one yeah. is trying to make the yeah. student more critically yeah. aware. Yeah. In our, in our first professional semester, so one of the assignments that we've created, these integrated assignments I was talking about earlier, is they have to develop. One, one of the things they need to, products they need to create in the field is a unit plan. So one of the first things we've done is they have to do this unit plan. It's an integrated unit plan. And what, the bulk of the assessment isn't the product of the plan. It's a series of, we call them sort of defense papers, where they say, OK, here's what I've learned about assessment, for example, during the semester. And here's how I've put it into action. Here's, what I've, here's how I've put what I've learned into action in this unit plan. So they're making concrete links between things they've learned in the course and things that they've done in, their, in, in the product that they've created. And we ask them to do that for each of the courses in, in that semester. And that, it, so we're trying to get them to not just give us a product, mm -hmm. but be able to talk about what went into that product and what awareness is. And I think there's always a gap between our metacognitive understanding of things and our performance. So there are dancers who are clearly aware mm -hmm. of elements of dance that they're just not. Putting into practice. Well, they can't yet. Either, <laughs> yeah. either, they, yeah. either 
physical reasons that they can't or, you know, they, you know, whatever, or they're just not had the experience in the practice yet. But it doesn't mean they don't have the conceptual understanding. Yeah. Right? yeah. So an assessment that just looks at practice and just evaluates the product actually underrepresents an important part of what it means to be a dancer mm -hmm. if we don't bring that, that other dimension the thinking, into it, right, yeah, in the thinking. Yeah. And, and, and then there are people who are brilliant dancers who don't necessarily have always the conceptual awareness of why they're so good at what they do, yeah. right? And if we ignore that piece of it, um, you know, we're not, we're not helping either of those people, right, I think. So that's something that we've really done in our work in the program and in my work with writing is get at that thinking behind the product. And hopefully, yeah. I suppose, with the faculty then yeah. here is, is that same uh, procedure mm -hmm. that people would see um, that value of, of the assessment as, a, as an ongoing process right. with the students and yeah. not an open and shut yeah. uh, case. Yeah. I mean, it really, it cuts everywhere. If I'm measuring science, right, growth, you know, if I'm looking at developing a scientist, well, what is it, what does it, what do I need to know and be able to do? What sort of dispositions do I need to develop in order to be an effective scientist, right? Okay, well then, how am I, you know, how am I, how am I building that, in my, how are we building that in our programs? Right. How are we measuring that in you our, in our assessments? You may have to be a good team member to work right. in a lab. Do we have yeah. any assessment around right. that? Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, the, dis, you know, the new, the new um, science building is all about designed for integrated teaching and learning in science. We'll what, see how that what, goes. <laughs> what does assessment look like there? Right? That new, and if we don't new. modify our assessment, right? If we, if we continue to go, we're gonna assess in physics and we're gonna assess in chemistry and we're gonna assess in, but now we have this new space that's all about integrated teaching and learning in sciences. What are the implications for how, um, how we're gonna assess students? Yeah. How they're going to be formed, really. How they're going to be yeah. formed, how they're going to be assessed. And I can tell you, if we continue to assess in the ways that we've, we've done historically, a transformative teaching space, generally speaking, doesn't translate into transformative teaching because the assessment <laughs> practices still drive, drive learning. Right? We see this it was when we look at this new curriculum redesign at the high school level. It's been the one point I've been trying to make all along. You can redesign curriculum all you want. If you don't redesign assessment to go along with that redesigning curriculum, you're really not going to move anywhere. You know? Yeah. Or you're just going to stay stuck in the same practices yeah. we've always been in. Yeah. Um. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? This is always how we uh, finish yeah. an interview. What are you looking forward to most in the next period of work? Or yeah. what are you fearing most in the next period of work, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, excited about I mean, I'm excited about stepping into this role. I think when I got here in 2011, you you really kind of tunnel into your own your own work and, and and in your own faculty, and I really see this as an opportunity to really to kind of expand my experience at the U of L and to really connect with you know with other faculties and and, and other uh, other instructors here, and that I think that's the part I'm looking uh, looking the most um, the most forward to, um, and uh, you know. I, in my proposal, I talked about my work in writing and my work in assessment, and those are both areas that I'm really interested in meeting with faculty on and, and, and um, working with faculty um, around the, the, the questions that they have and the things that they want to work on. I, I don't really think I, I come to this with an agenda specifically, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that to say, you know, we really need to do something about assessment here. We really need to do something about writing here. No, that's not it. But to say, you know what, these are things that I've worked with and I've thought through. and. Um, if there are faculty who have questions and, and interests in those areas and, and are looking for someone to work with, I, I'd be excited about that. So I'm excited Excellent. about the time, you know, the time that comes with being a teaching chair and then it, it frees it's up for really that kind of space, I think is something that I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. thank you very much for taking the time to do the interview yeah. and uh, I'm so looking forward to working yeah. with you. Yeah, no, I'm very excited. I think uh, I've heard lots of great things and done a few things with the Teaching Center already and, and really enjoyed the group. So I'm really looking forward to that as well.